Hi, thanks for tuning in to part two of the Print in Place C-Scooter build, where I'll be focusing on how to drive a propeller without any direct connection through the hull, dispensing with a need for any holes, seals, or even a shaft. Its success will entirely hinge on the power of magnets. As I don't know the exact power characteristics of the drive system, I'll also test how much thrust the system can actually produce with a variety of cutting edge propeller designs that were previously optimized to work efficiently with a similar size, speed, and power envelope. I genuinely have no idea how the design perform. So this will be really exciting to see. For those that haven't seen the first video in the series, we're building a 3D printed sea scooter that has a couple of interesting design constraints thrown in. The first being that the hull must be printed in place with all the electronics, motor, and power added during the print. The second being that the scooter must be hermetically sealed and isolated from the environment with no holes for power, control, or a shaft to drive the propeller. In the last video, we looked at testing how best we could waterproof a 3D printed hull at up to 40 meters water depth, where we had some really interesting results. So today I'm designing a non-contact drive system for the propeller that doesn't require a hole to be made in the hull for a shaft or power. I'm gonna try and be clever and combine a non-contact drive system that incorporates a reduction gearbox, known as a magnetic gear, to better match the motor with the propeller. A magnetic gear is made up of three components, an inner rotor, fill concentrator, and outer rotor. As the inner rotator rotates, the outer magnetic field rotor rotates in the opposite direction by an amount that is equal to the ratio of the outer to inner number of magnetic pole pairs. So in this design, the ratio is four to one. If you're interested in more detail of the construction of the magnetic gear and how it works and performs, check out the link in the description below to the previous in-depth magnetic gear video I did. Right, for this design to work, I'm gonna to need to be able to incorporate the fill concentrator layer that contains the five soft iron fill concentrators into the wall of the hull. And so we'll need to be able to print this together with the hull in one go. The simplest setup I can come up with to test this integrated magnetic gear design is to create an access port in the hull and add a motor and a motor mount, powering the motor remotely using an external power supply. Okay, enough talk, let's print out some parts. We're also gonna to need to cut some five millimeter thick strips of low carbon iron to use as the magnetic concentrators. To make this easy for myself, I decided to build a cross cutting jig for my grinder. This design also incorporates a fence to make cutting the same dimensions easy. As you can see, it does the job fairly well. I think the only slight addition I'd like to incorporate into the design is to add a strip of metal angle to the fence and square edge that are in contact with the part to prevent the plastic from melting, which as you can see, it did start to do a little bit. If you want to see how the cross cutting jig is designed and put together, I'm going to release a video on that very soon. So do look out for that. So here are all the pieces needed to put together the test hull. So we've basically got the test hull and the magnetic drive fitted on the bottom. So here's the soft iron layer already inserted to try pushed in through the top. And inside that is the inner magnetic rotor. Fitting on the outside of that is the outer rotor, which you can see contains soft iron outer ring, which increases the flux density on the inside of the magnets, making our magnetic gear stronger, as we saw in the magnetic gear test video. Like this. And you need some epoxy to connect these two parts together. And before doing that, I need to put the motor housing connected into the center like this, with this bolted on the top, and a shaft coupling between to link the magnetic gearbox to the motor. So let's give that a go first. This is the reason that I had to buy these guys. So I need a really long hex thread to be able to screw it into the other side of the motor mount. Okay, that's pretty firm. Oh, it's in. This is a very good sign. All right, now this should click in place. Okay, that clicks in place. Now you can see the central shaft turning when I turn the outer shaft. Unfortunately, I'm gonna to have to glue this in because these tabs are not gonna be strong enough. OK, 
Okay, let's leave that for half an hour. Right, the last things to do are to glue the shroud onto the hull and to coat the surface in epoxy. This time, I'm gonna try the readily available five minute epoxy that you can get from a local hardware store rather than the flexible epoxy I used last time, as I'm not expecting there to be much elastic deformation of the plastic this time around compared with the pressure testing video, and it's much, much quicker to cure. Just cut out the lid and make some holes to pass through the power cable so I can attach the lid and we are good to start testing. Okay, wait a minute. I'm going to need to measure how much thrust the test hull propeller combo will actually produce. Let's take the biggest plastic box I can find, add a gantry and a sled to it and attach the test hull underneath it. That way we can constrain the motion to one dimension to measure the static thrust. The only other piece we are missing is actually a way of measuring the thrust. I could buy a load cell, calibrate it, attach a microcontroller to it and some sort of display. Or I could repurpose a luggage scale, which has a resolution of 10 grams or 0.1 newtons, which should do the job. Great, so the design is done. Let's print out the parts. And first of all, we're gonna to connect together the gantries with some screws. Right, well, that's not gonna work, is it? Lovely jubbly, solid with anything. Had to put a smaller M4 bolt in here because there's not enough clearance. Very solid, great. I will tighten that up in a moment. I think I'm making a bit of a meal of this. Let's do the central sled. I've already put some inset square nuts to capture the bolts. I'm just gonna attach them loosely for now because we'll have to undo them when we attach them to the test hull. So you've had to countersink the two vertical bolts so I can still, so they can go below where the horizontal bolt goes in. Let's build the big bits together. There we go, just a little bit of coaxing, did it? Well, can't say it's not snug. We're missing one piece, which is the thing that's gonna be doing the measurement. Okay, so here's the finished test rig. Right, as I said earlier, I'm gonna test four contrasting designs for propellers to see which is the best match. These designs were some of the top ranking propeller designs for the RC Test Flight propeller competition that was run in the summer. Thanks to RC Test Flight and the participants for making these designs available as part of the competition. I'll uh, pop a link in the description of the video if you're interested in the detailed tests of how these and a whole bunch of other propellers performed. Okay, so design one is known as the Spanner Maxing. It's a two blade prop with the end of the blades clipped and with a steep angle of attack on the route. Design two is called the FSXAS regular prop design with a really thin profile and a slight sweep back to the blades. Design three is called the Holbrook design, also a two blade design with a really unusual concertina blade shape with a much smaller overall di diameter. Design four, another FSX AS propeller called the original toroidal. As you can see, this has a toroidal shaped blade with two blades that loop together to create a closed form structure that has no blade tips. This one has four, possibly two blades, depending on how you count them. And again, a smaller diameter. Really interesting to see how this one does as toroidal blades are supposed to be much quieter. Each test, I set the power supply to 24 volts and ramp up the current in 0.1 amp increments from around two amps to around four amps. Let's get testing. So first up, the Holbrook. Let's get started. Oh, wrong direction. Let's reverse the polarity. That's better. Magnetic gear loses synchronization around four amps. I'm gonna take the max thrust to be about 0.64 kilograms. 
Okay, next up is the toroidal propeller. Okay, here we go. Again, the wrong direction. If only the power terminals weren't to screw on. And we're off. But that really does seem a lot quieter. I'm going to take 0.7 kilos as the max thrust and it levels off at about 0.65 kilograms. Okay, on to number three, the span maxing. Here we go. Oh, what are the chances? Wrong direction again. Okay. The tips are coming out of the water, unfortunately, and I can't really increase the water level further, so this, this is going to have to do. It touches the high 60s, but seems to level off at about 0.49 kilos. Let's go on to the last design, the sweepback design. Okay, here we go. Oh, of course, wrong direction again, and we're off. Like the spanner maxing, the tips are coming out of the water, which will definitely reduce the efficiency. It's actually high 60s, but seems to level off about 0.6 kilograms. Right, now time to come clean. To accommodate the magnetic gear, I decided to scale up the propellers by a third, so the hub was large enough to mount. In hindsight, this was a pretty stupid idea. I should have just made an adapter that the propeller connected to rather than changing the dimensions of the actual blade. Given the propellers were designed for a maximum of 400 watts of input power, if anything, I should have probably scaled them down, as a sea scooter system has a theoretical max power of about 200 watts. To test this assertion and my faith in physics, let's also run a smaller non-scaled version of the FSXAS regular propeller with a sweep back blade design using a mounted adapter. Here we go. The blades are completely submerged, so it should help if nothing else. Wow, that really gets some resonance building up in the mid-range. Not sure how the mic is, how well the mic's picking that up, but it's actually making the whole room shake. You can see the force meter assembly wobbling as well. It touches 0.78 kg max thrust and levels off to around 0.75 kilograms. So we're absolutely getting more thrust from the smaller diameter. The sweat black blade design has the thinnest cross section, which I think, given it was only printed in PLA, might have led to some unwanted resonance in the blades. So here you can see the constant and max thrust values for each of the propellers tested. For the sea scooter design, I'm actually leaning towards the toroidal propeller, as it seems the most stable and was the quietest by a mile. It also had the second highest max power output, and bear in mind it was printed with a 0.8mm nozzle, the finished surface is very rough, so there's plenty of room for improvement there. Definitely scope for a second round of testing with smaller props that have also been made smooth. I wouldn't be surprised if we could eke out at least another 10% of thrust, but for now, we've certainly achieved our goal which was design, build, and test a drive system for the sea scooter that didn't require any holes to be made in the hull. The magnetic gear design has been successfully integrated into the hull and shown to be printable in a single print. We've also now got a good idea of the max current draw before the magnetic gear decouples and a ballpark for the amount of thrust we might expect. To top it off, we've successfully put into practice what was learned in the last video on how to waterproof the hull and kept the hull completely dry. In the next part, I'll tackle the air gap control systems and power management for the sea scooter. How can we design a reliably remotely operated mass on off switch, feed throttle control signals and incorporate motor control and battery management with enough batteries into the hull? If you like this video, then you might also enjoy this one too. Thanks for watching and uh, bye for now.